So brothers and sisters, I want to look at the power of renewal because you and I won't follow the fullness of God's teachings unless we know his power. And you might say, you see, some churches and some people think, well, when I am born again, when I ask Jesus to come into my life, I am saved and that's that. And you know what? That's only the beginning. Would anyone say amen? amen. That's only the beginning. And you know what the Bible says? It says you and I serve God. Um, the book of Proverbs says, he or she who waters will themselves be watered. Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. So you and I are receiving and giving, and as we give, we need to receive. We need our batteries charged. So we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit the first time, but then we need to be renewed regularly so that we are recharged to give and to serve and to love and to be the people God has called us to be. And so I want to talk about the power of renewal this morning. You know, Paul said in Corinthians, and I quote it directly from the Greek, be ye being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's called the present continuous tense. It's ongoing. It's regular. So it's not just reading a nice psalm and going, oh, that was lovely. That's not what being filled with the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is being filled with power. Hallelujah. Amen. Anyone say hallelujah? Amen. Would you say hallelujah up in the atrium? Yeah, okay, <laughs> I think we heard you. God wants to fill us, and the Christians in the New Testament were regularly filled with the power of God. So I'm going to just read some scripture, and this is set in what is today Turkey, a couple of towns, doesn't matter where they were, but what does matter is what God did with them. So we're going to start off with Paul and Barnabas, two great men of God, and what they experienced back then. So may God bless his word to our souls. Amen. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas preached the word of God boldly. And the Lord proved their message was true, how? With signs and wonders following. But a jealous mob attacked them, and they had to flee to Lystra. But that mob followed them there and attacked them again. They beat Paul up so badly, they left him for dead outside town. But after the believers had gathered round them, he got up and he went back into the city. And the next day, Paul and Barnabas left for Derbe. But some time later, they returned again to Lystra and Iconium, encouraging the believers, establishing churches with local leaders. Amen. Amen. We're told here that these men of faith were preaching the word of God boldly. I wonder, can we really ever preach God's word without a boldness? Boldness means courage. And they shared the word of God with courage, not insensitivity, not shouting or shoving it down someone's throat, but they had a confidence, they had a boldness. Sometimes that needs to be expressed, sometimes it's something within. But they were not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, hallelujah. And they shared it in a place where uh, people probably had never heard it before. A bit like Ireland today. A lot of people say, well, Ireland is very religious. Not anymore. No. no. Most people barely know who Jesus is in secular Ireland today. They know more about transgender than they will about being transformed by the Holy Spirit. They just don't know it. It's, it's unknown. And we're told that as they preached God's word boldly, the Lord proved their message was true by giving them signs and wonders following. What does that mean? It means miracles. It means when people were sick and they prayed and laid hands on them, they were healed. When someone was tormented by an evil spirit, they were delivered. When someone needed um, a miracle in their finances, it happened. When relationships were at the end, God restored them. That's what it means. There were signs and wonders following. 
I remember a Christian telling me once they just needed miraculous signs in the New Testament times so the gospel would be established. We don't need it today. I would come to that argument and say, oh my goodness, do we need that today? In secular Europe, where people, many of them hate faith, they hate anything to do with faith or spirituality, they particularly hate Christianity, where there's a militant move against it, we need signs and wonders following. You do in your school, in your workplace, on your street, in your family, so do I. And so God, do you know, there's something when a miracle happens, when a healing happens, and we've seen some here, but we need more. There's something happens where all the walls of argument just collapse. And this is what happened here. But of course, what happened? Jealousy kicks in. It always happens when someone is successful. If you're successful at work, there's probably someone in your office is jealous of you. If you're successful in sport or in school, I bet you there's someone who's jealous of you. And then you heighten that more spiritually. If you have a successful ministry or church or whatever, sometimes the evil one gets in there. And there's a jealousy and there's an opposition. And these people weren't Christians. They were a mob, a crowd, a gang. They had a bit of religion going on, but they weren't believers. And they attack Paul and Barnabas. And so the guys had to go to another town. They avoided the hassle. They didn't fight them, they just moved on. Jesus said that. If you're persecuted in one town, flee to the next. And some of you have come here from places of persecution around the world to have um, a safer experience where you can live your faith. Praise God. But they were attacked and then were told the mob followed them in verse 19 to this next town of Lystra and they attacked them again. The attacks continued. There's someone here, maybe you're in the atrium and the Lord is saying, you're after getting the same attack twice and I believe from the Holy Spirit, this is within the last few weeks. It's like you had a big attack from the enemy and the enemy has attacked you again. We're gonna pray for you at the end of this service and we're gonna pray that that's the end of it. Will anyone say amen? amen. We're gonna pray that Satan would be stopped in his tracks and he'll never get at you that way again. Paul was attacked the same way again. Barnabas was attacked the same way again. That was the opposition. So much so we're told that they beat Paul up badly. If you read the full chapter yourself, you see they did it by a thing called stoning. They got big rocks and they they would put the guy in the middle and there'd be a circle of people against him and they would keep throwing big rocks at that poor man or woman until they were dead. So you'd get a big rock in your eye, another one on your skull, in your kidney, on your hip, and so on and so on. And he was beaten up badly. He was being stoned to death. For what? For loving Jesus Christ? Do you think humanity has changed? Praise God, we do live in a country, it may be militantly secular, and there may be a little bit of opposition if you have a faith, but this is a safe place to be a Christian. Would anyone say, thank you, Jesus? Amen. We can have our faith here, and we can practice our faith here, and we can move forward, but back then, it was really difficult. And what happened? They left Paul for dead. The people who hated him, attacked him and left him for dead. Here's the Holy Spirit speaking. Have you been left for dead? Has someone given up on you? Friendship? Relationship? In your job? In school? Is it your faith? Is it a ministry? Some of us here have been left for dead. We're like Paul. You're trying your best. You're doing your best. You're keeping a clear conscience with God. You're loving your family. You're paying your bills and your taxes. You're doing the right things. And you've been attacked and you've been left for dead. The God I know is a God of resurrection. Hallelujah. If someone has left you for dead, Jesus hasn't. Would anyone say amen? amen. Jesus hasn't left you for dead because he's the God of resurrection. 
and Paul was left for dead. And you know what I would expect here now? I would now expect that God would send an angel from heaven and heal Paul. Or I would expect that Paul would just get a surge of power from heaven to be healed. I mean, he healed a load of people. Surely he can have some for himself. He was preaching the gospel. He didn't do anything wrong. Surely God could heal him. But we don't read that God healed him. We don't read about an angel coming. We read nothing like that. What we do read is, after the believers gathered around him, Paul got up again. Hallelujah. Amen. Paul got up again. What did the believers do? You see, this is where we, we really have to just dig in for a moment. Did they gather around him by just, as we say in Cork, having a good old gawk? What does that mean for those who aren't from Cork? That means they just came around to have a look. Do you know the way someone has an accident on the road and people rubberneck, everyone slows down just to have a good look, but nobody kind of gets up usually to help, they just have a look. Is that what gather around him means? I mean, did they kind of say to one another, mm, he lost his two front teeth, did you see that? I did, yeah. And he's got a really swollen eye there. Mm, I'd say the leg is gone there, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that what it means to gather around? Absolutely not. What did they do? They cherished him. That's what we read at the start. They looked at their beloved brother and they loved on him. And they prayed with him. And they physically helped him. And they would have helped him up. Paul didn't just jump up, they would have helped him up. It's like the Lord withheld the healing so that Paul could experience the love of the brothers and sisters gathering around him. Here's the moral of the story. We need one another. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You, you need it. I need it. We need the believers to gather around us, to love us, to nurture us, to encourage us, to pray with us, to help us. And we need to do it for others. It was never your destiny, ever. It was never my destiny to just live in isolation. It is always God's will. And I know we're in a time of transition. I'm not making any comments right now. But, but it is God's will that we have believers around us. And Paul experienced that. And what did Paul do? I love this. After he got up, did he say, come on, let's get to a safe place now? What does he do? He went back into the city. Now, where do you think the mob, the crowd who tried to kill him were? Do you think they headed off down the highway to the motorway services? I don't think so. They went back into the city. And where does Paul go? He goes back into the city. Now I spoke about it last week, about the guys letting their friend down through the hole in the roof and the stretcher to be healed by Jesus. And we were saying, what would the HSE say? What would health and safety say to that guy on the stretcher? They'd say, you have a one in two chance of falling off and breaking your skull. Don't go there. What do you think they'd say to Paul heading back into the city? I think health and safety would say, uh-uh, don't go back in there, Paul. You're in danger. But yet, Paul went back into the city. And here I touch on something else that's really alive today. The psychiatrists are calling it re-entry anxiety. Paul had every reason to have re-entry anxiety. And this actually, from what we understand, it's really not so much about the virus, it's a confidence thing. It's, what are the rules of social interaction? I haven't done it in over a year. Particularly people who live alone. How do I handle myself again? Do I feel confident enough to go into a social setting, even a church setting? And there's a whole anxiety, and we're all different, and some of us have just great confidence and we're back in the door straight away. But I would say quite a number of us in the building here today have re-entry anxiety. But there's something in you and you're going, I'm not going to let this rule my life. I am not going to let an anxiety become my identity. Would anyone say amen? amen? There's a time, I get it, where you do have to isolate. I'm not saying there isn't that, but it can't be forever. I remember in the Canary Islands in 2006, my son and I almost died. We were drowning in Lanzarote. Seriously, almost died. 
we were rescued, praise God, I'll never forget it. But you know what I did the next day? I went back down to that same beach and I went back into the water. I didn't want to go in the water. I certainly didn't go swimming out where I almost drowned. But I went back into the water because I said to them, and I thank God in the water for my rescue, my deliverance. But I said to the Lord and to myself, I am not going to spend the rest of my life with that kind of anxiety in my head so that I'll always be afraid to go into water. I'm not going to live my life like that. You have one life. Your life is not um, a rehearsal. This is it. Oh, am I really going to live my life with an anxiety over me, uh, determining where I can or cannot go? So I went back into the water, and as someone of faith like you, I just prayed that God would take away any fear, any phobia that I might develop. Now, I've never gone back to swimming to the same degree again, but I promise you, and I stand before God as he's listening, I have no fear of the water. Hallelujah. I can go swimming in the sea and I will not be afraid, even though I almost died. I refuse, as a child of God, I refuse to let fear overcome me, to let anxiety be my master. I have one master and his name is Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. And Paul went back into the city and he didn't allow his anxiety to determine his next step. And so he goes back in. And what do we see? Sometime later, he does a secondary entry. And he goes back to those cities again with Barnabas. And they go right back into the place of danger. But they encourage the believers. Do you know when we come in here, you might just think I'm coming in here to receive. You know what? Your presence is encouraging people around you. Amen? Amen? People are encouraged to see you. People are encouraged to be part of something bigger than themselves. We are not on our own with a phone. We are part of the army of God. Would anyone say hallelujah? hallelujah. They encouraged the believers. They established churches and they appointed local elders. Praise God. That's what they did. Paul and Barnabas never lost the sight of the calling of God on their lives. You might say, I'm not called to be a pastor. It doesn't matter. You're called to be a Christian. And as a Christian, God wants you to be an overcomer. He doesn't want you and me to live in fear. Does anyone agree? Yes. We're not called to be fear. We fear God. But we don't fear man, and we don't fear stuff like that. And so Paul and Barnabas did what they had to do, and it goes back to the fact that they needed one another. They went back in. And you know, I love Ecclesiastes 3. I'm keeping an eye on the time. There is a time for everything. You know that scripture. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to laugh and a time to weep. There's a time for everything. We have had a long time where we couldn't do so much as a church community. You and I have had a long time as individuals where we couldn't do things. Praise God, we seem to be really coming out of it. But you know what I think it's really time for as well? It's time for ministry of the Holy Spirit to really resume. And it's also time to have parties. <laughs> Did you know... Jesus attended a lot of parties. More people were healed. More people were led to faith. More people got hope at parties that Jesus went to. And he went to a couple of hairy parties. But people met with Jesus there. And I think we need, as soon as we can, to start throwing parties in the church again. To start eating curry together. Would anyone say amen? Amen. We need to do community again. And I can imagine there's someone going, they're a really fleshly bunch. You know what? The Bible says community, fellowship is a spiritual activity. They devoted themselves to prayer, to the breaking of bread, to the study of God's word, and to fellowship, to community. So you and I, 
are leaving one season and we're coming towards another season. The Irish government and the health service were announcing today they're hoping to start matches, sporting events and concerts in July. You know, by the way, if you come from another country, you need to follow the local news for Ireland because it affects your life. What's happening in another country doesn't as much affect you as what's happening here. You get a better sense of where this nation is going if you follow the, what's happening locally. If that is happening, how much more should we start having parties? Hallelujah. As soon as we can, we're going to do it. As soon as we can, we're going to be anointing people with oil. As soon as we can, we're going to be baptizing people and smothering them under the water. Hallelujah. Not smothering, just, just putting them under. There's a time for everything. But we will never overcome anxiety. You and I will never overcome the fear. Even people who don't have fear naturally still experience fear from time to time. Unless we are renewed by the filling of the Holy Spirit when we go low, unless your spiritual battery or my spiritual battery is recharged, our anxiety, our fear, our worry will overcome us and we'll never be the men and women God has called us to be. So I encourage you and I plead with you, if you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, today is the day. Amen. Hallelujah. And if you've been filled with the Spirit before and you know you need to be filled again, the Lord will fill you again today. Hallelujah. Let me do one last slide. And this is from a man. Exactly a hundred years ago, May 1921, this man was preaching in the northeast of England. Great man of God. Look him up. Smith Wigglesworth was his name. And he said, if you are really filled and renewed with the Holy Spirit, you'll do more in one year than you could in 50 years without. So we can take 50 years to get there, or we can take a fraction of that time by saying, fill me again, Holy Spirit. Come and fill me for the first time, or fill me again so that I will overcome my anxiety and overcome my fear. The guys are going to play a beautiful song. It's called Holy Spirit, You Are Welcome Here. I'm going to ask everyone to remain seated up in the atrium as well, down in the Space and Cafe Church in here. But as the guys sing, I want you to reflect on this thing. If you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit for the first time, or you need to be filled again, I'm going to ask you, as the guys sing this, that you would just stand. Some of us don't need this. We've already had it happen, perhaps, recently, ourselves. But for those who need it today, there's no shame. This is a very noble prayer. Just going to ask you to stand, if that's your prayer, while the guys are worshipping. Otherwise, just remain seated. And we're going to pray. Can we throw up the words? It's a beautiful song. Close your eyes. Let the Holy Spirit move. And then as the Spirit leads you, stand or remain seated for prayer. Steve.
Hamilton, you're welcome to come and stand at the top. We need to start getting back to church in a real way. Just try and keep a distance from the person next to you, but we have enough room here. Come forward to receive the filling of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Just keep playing, guys. Hallelujah. The Lord would say to some people as well that you're going to be filled for the first time today. I'm just going to reach out. I know you're up in the atrium. Dean O'Keefe, I know the Lord is saying to you, he's going to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Open up your heart now because God is going to flood you with his Holy Spirit. Praise God. Praise God. Can we lift our hands, guys? Now you've left your seat, you're owning this prayer, and you're crying out for the Lord to fill you again. Just lift your hands to heaven. Come now, Holy Spirit of faith, we proclaim, we declare, there is only one God and his name is Jesus. And you have promised that if we ask our Heavenly Father for bread, you will not give us stones. And so we ask you now, for the Holy Spirit of fire to come upon every brother, every sister standing in the house of God today. And I see you all. If you're watching online, we have a whole bunch of people standing here. And now as our hands are lifted up, we pray, come Holy Spirit, fill my brothers and sisters to overflowing with the power of the resurrected Savior. Let tongues of fire fall upon you and new. I want you to say the words after me, fill me Holy Spirit, at the count of three. Those four words, fill me Holy Spirit. Okay? I know there's one or two of you doing this for the first time. I'm just going to pray for you in a moment, but I want to pray collectively. Let's pray together. One, two, three. Fill me Holy Spirit. Let's do it again. One, two, three. Fill me, Holy Spirit. 